Hey, we're good. good. We're live. Single order of the district's major federal awards programs for the same fiscal year end, as well as an audit of the district's extra collection activity funds on the cash basis of accounting. And we issued our management letter presenting any findings or recommendations that we have uh, to, go, to go through on the internal controls. I'm just going to switch to the presentation myself. So I think you all have it. So before I get into going through over the financial statements, I always like to talk about the conduct of the audit. So, um, so again, as everybody knows, this was a very unusual year, especially for us in trying to perform an audit engagement with the district. Um, we kind of, uh, at the beginning in our planning stages, we worked with management, kind of come up with a plan of conducting the field work in a remote capacity as well as an on-site. So we kind of did like a hybrid approach where we, uh, where the management uploaded a lot of documents and records to us. We would kind of go through them. Make our selections, we'd ask for other things, they would kind of pack them up in the box, we'd come on site, go through them, pick them up, bring them, go through everything. So we uh we really appreciate obviously all the efforts by the business office to uh to help assist us because although um you know we had a lot of things going against us, we still had the October 15th deadline. So uh, so we set it in our plan to make sure that we were going to make that deadline, which we will. Um, but in doing so, obviously, our audit engagement took longer than usual. Um, so uh, because of those procedures, we're going back and forth. But the business office, once again, did a tremendous job, led by Jackie and Deborah, um, you know, managing all of our requests, getting us all the records, putting us in touch with the necessary people that we needed to speak to and go through things. So again, they, they have to still manage the district on a day-to-day -day basis and do their daily duties, but then we come in and really add a lot of burden to their uh, to their schedule, but um, again, they did uh, a tremendous job and we really appreciate all the efforts there. Um, and I think the biggest thing is just because of this, a lot of comments that I got was, well, did your risk change in the involved engagement and how you're comfortable with how everything was presented? Because again, it's in a kind of a hybrid model. And um, based on our preliminary assessment of risk, Everything that we identified as being either a, a risk or uh, associated to a risk, we were able to review adequately. We were comfortable with the records that we obtained, and we were able to mitigate all of those uh, issues that we saw as possible risk. So it required no other further investigation or anything other than what we initially sought out to. So just want to make sure I made the other community aware of that. And then just kind of going through the financial statements, um, I kind of broke it down in the section that I've done in previous years. So the first two pages is our auditor's opinion, which was a clean or modified opinion on the financial statements. Uh, the next 10 pages, pages 3 through 13, is the management's discussion and analysis section. This provides a general overview and analysis of the financial statements, as well as uh, compares financial data index of last year's uh, numbers and operating results, as well as addresses any key variances from last year to this year. Um, Again, I always believe the management discussion and analysis is uh, a really helpful tool to anybody who is not familiar with the financial statements of the district, because if you can read those 10 pages, it gives you a really good understanding of the differences of what I'm going to talk about in a couple of minutes between the two separate sets of financial statements, as well as some of the 
the, the key highlights that uh, that occurred at the district and things that will affect the district going into the future. So those kind of features really give you a great understanding of the financial statements. Um, after the management's discussion and analysis section is the first set of financial statements, which is called the district-wide financial statements. These are on the full accrual basis of accounting. So this has all of your capital assets, all of your long-term debt, all of those items are consolidated into these financial statements to give you a, a, like a full financial picture similar to a for-profit corporation. Um, so some of the things I want to highlight here is just, you can see that the working capital as well as the current ratio, which are things that we always measure on on the accounting side, improved from last year to this year. And that was primarily due to the increase in cash at the end of the year as a result of decreased spending because of the COVID-19 in the last quarter of the fiscal year. So um, as a result of that, obviously, it made the financial picture look a little better on a full accrual basis. You have uh, total capital assets, net of depreciation of $34.9 million, which with a current year net increase of just under $100,000. So your uh, capital uh, outlay or purchases of equipment uh, exceeded your depreciation charges for the year about $100,000. And the biggest thing that we've added onto the balance sheet over the last few years is called the other post-employment benefit obligation, which uh, for the end of the year, all uh, other post-employment benefit obligations of what's termed OPEP, related items total $41 million, which is a long-term liability, with a current year increase of about $1.1 million. So now this number is really it's, it's uh, calculated by an actuary that the district hires. Um, however, it's, it's really an accounting adjustment to the full accrual numbers. Uh, and I say that because the district cannot reserve any monies towards this long-term obligation. Uh, it cannot set aside any monies for this uh, obligation either. The only thing it can do is pay, at, you know, pay as, it, as it comes due. So all your current outlay relating to this obligation is about $855,000. So that's the amount that is an actual cash outflow for the year in terms of this obligation, and that continues to be paid on an ongoing basis and current. Um, for the current year, in relation to this, because it did have that big increase, um, some, of the th some of the things changed on the actuarial side. The biggest thing being the discount rate that they utilized. So they went from a 3.5% uh, discount rate to a 2.21% discount rate. Um, and that was really a change that was done industry-wide um, by the actuaries to conform with the actual accounting pronouncement that oversaw this uh, implementation of uh, OPEP. After the full accrual statements is the governmental fund financial statements. Those are the funds that are managed by the district on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the district has, I believe, four uh, uh, governmental funds. Each one is uh, utilized for a specific purpose. Um, the general fund is kind of the overall uh, the overall fund that's um, utilized uh, based on the budget of the, the year and by the voters. So that, that fund had total assets of $18.8 million at the end of the year, with total liabilities of $3 million, which are all comparable with the previous year, which left us with fund balance of about $15.8 million. Of that fund balance, there's different classifications. Uh, there is the unassigned, unappropriated, so that's uh, to be utilized by the district go forward at their discretion, total $2.9 million. You have 830,000 in assigned funds. These are monies that are used to uh, balance next year's budget, as well as encumbrances that carry over from the current year to the next year, uh, which are uh, expenditures that just have not been uh, received by the district by June 30. And then you have $12 million of restricted funds, with a large portion of that being in your capital reserve fund and in your retirement contribution. Uh, reserve fund as well. For the year on an operating basis of so the general fund, uh, had a positive change in fund balance of about $2.4 million. Comparing the budget, the revenues were over budget by about $349,000, and your expenditures were under budget by about $3.4 million. Again, as I spoke before, obviously that there was some savings towards the end of the fiscal year because of the, the, the in-school in construction shutdown. So, uh, many districts obviously save money on that side with the uh, understanding that a large, large portion of that is being spent in the summer to get ready for the new fiscal years uh, and to be able to bring students back into the classrooms. 
The next fund is the capital projects fund. That's the fund that manages all the capital projects throughout the district. Um, here, you can see that your assets is about $315,000 with a little bit of about $4,000 in liabilities, giving you a fund balance of about $310,000 relating to uh, ongoing future projects. For the year, you had about $1.3 million in capital outlay, which uh, represented the amount of money spent on the capital projects on the district-wide basis. The next fund is the uh, special aid fund. This is a fund that's utilized for the federal and state grants that are administered here throughout the district. These are reimbursable grants, so there is no fund balance or there is no net income or loss for the year. So it's a self-balancing fund. So your assets will equal your liabilities, uh, as well as your revenues will equal your expenditures. Um, for the most part, again, these are fully reimbursable grants, except there are some grants like the summer school handicap program where there is a subsidized portion that comes from the general fund to make that uh, whole. So, um, so that's the other financing sources of about $62,000 that came from the general fund to balance that fund. The next fund is the school lunch fund, which obviously and, uh, looks after the, the food nutrition program here at the district. Um, you have total revenues of about $350,000 to about $340,000 in expenses. You had a slight increase for the year of $23,000 within that fund. Again, you can see that there was some uh, decreased variances from last year to this year, again, because of losing those three months towards the end of the year, um, you know, for uh, serving meals and then uh, charging for them. So. The last fund, which isn't a fund anymore, but the district used to have a bit like that service fund, which was closed at the end of last year. So, um, so this just shows that the, the full closing of it at the end of the year. After the governmental funds is the fiduciary fund financial statements. These are the monies that the district holds in a fiduciary or trustee capacity. It's mainly extra classroom activity funds, scholarship funds, things of that nature. The district cannot utilize these funds uh, to pay its, its bills. So these are uh, in a fiduciary type of a fund and set aside. Um, the presentation here has not changed from the previous year. After the fiduciary funds are the notes to the financial statements, which gives the reader a more detailed understanding of the accounting policies, as well as some uh, detailed information around uh, certain larger balances like your capital assets, long-term obligations, uh, your pension plans, and your other post employment benefit obligation. Um, the presentation here, again, is consistent with the previous year. Um, and the notes here are, I'd like to mention that they're in accordance with the New York State Education Department guidelines. So every year, the New York State Education Department issues what they call their reference manual, which is pretty much a template of the way in which they would like the financial statements to be formatted and, and laid out. So we make sure that the notes and the financial statements adhere to that so that we are in conformity with what the Education Department is looking for. In the After the notes are um, supplementary schedules, um, again, the presentation is consistent here. Um, some of these schedules are required by the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, and then some are required by the New York State Education Department. So uh, again, these schedules are consistent with the previous year. There have been no changes or edit schedules uh, like there have been over the last few years. So we like to see the consistency there uh, from one year to the other. Then it goes into the extra classroom activity funds. I mentioned earlier, we perform the audit on the cash basis of accounting. So it's just cash in and cash out for the clubs. We reviewed uh, the financial transaction within all the clubs here, and we issued an unmodified or clean opinion on, on the uh, extra activity funds as presented. Can you just uh, explain yeah. that for a minute? Clean opinion. Mm -hmm. So, a clean opinion is uh, it pretty much is stating that the way in which the financial statements are presented for us are, is not only in accordance with U.S. generally accepted accounting principles. Um, you know, like your main statements are, are more on the accrual basis of accounting, where these are the cash basis of accounting, and those are all segregated out. And it also means that we conducted our audit, our audit in accordance with generally accepted audit procedures. So it's it's pretty much a clean bill of health, so to speak. You know, that's the type of opinion you want. If we had issues, it would be a modified opinion, and we disclosed to you what those issues were that we found that either couldn't lead us to uh, obtain uh, clarity or uh, uh, supporting documentation for certain numbers and things of that nature. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then kind of rounding out the report, 
is the federal single audit. Again, um, because the district received more than $750 in federal funds for the year, we had to perform a single audit, which is um, not only a financial audit, but it's also a compliance-based audit, depending on the program. So we looked at the various uh, federal funds that were received by the district and going through the criteria, we select what we call as a major program. Um, and for this year, we selected the section 611 and 619 programs, which relate to special education. So we, we looked at those programs again, not on just on the financial base, but also the compliance that surrounds those specific programs, which is given to us by uh, the Office of Management and Budget, the OMB, uh, and it's called the Uniform Guidance, and it's a compliance supplement. So we go through that depending on each specific grant has uh, what they call it a CFDA number that's specific to that grant. And within the compliance supplement, it tells you the types of compliance issues or uh, adherence that the district should have for that type of grant. And we have to make sure that everything's done there. In our audit of those programs, everything is found to be in order and in conformity with the compliance requirements. So we had no, no instances of non-compliance or question costs relating to those. So again, for the, uh, the federal award programs, we, we issued a clean or unmodified opinion on those as well. For the year, um, we just had, now switching gears just to the financial statements overall, we did have compliance findings relating to the late filing of the SD3, which I've talked about that the, the date to, to file that is, is very unrealistic because you have to file it within the early part of September, usually September 2nd or 3rd. We're still conducting the audit at that point, so the books and records technically are not closed. So uh, the district usually, and with our agreement, will not file something that would not be a final or a complete vision of what the, the district should have there. So they held off on that. It has been filed and it is complete. Um, and for this year, it was also a setting for uh, excess fund balance. So you're only allowed to carry 4% of next year's budget in the unassigned, unappropriated category. Because of the excess monies that were uh, you know, saved this year, but being part of the earmark for the upcoming year, that pushed us over the 4% budget. So um, I totally agree with the way in which everything was handled. Um, all of my clients are in the same exact situation as you. It's not like you're unique in any which way. Um, and, um, but unfortunately, I have to cite it because it, it, it is what it is. Um, but you know, I want to make sure that the, uh, yeah, he's got my take on it, that I, I agree with uh, the district stands on those two issues. Outside of that, the biggest thing I'd like to also talk about is in our reviews of all of the internal controls over the financial reporting, uh, and the general ledger and, and looking at the transactions of the district. We found there to be no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies. Uh, we also uh, did not come up with any current year recommendations or what I like to call suggestions, you know, to improve upon those internal controls, as well as the, the policies uh, that the districts have, have that the district has in place relating to uh, its financial transactions and things of that nature. So I you know I like always like to end with we gave clean, unmodified opinions. We have no suggestions or recommendations. There were no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies. So the last thing I, you know, to convey to you is that this is a very clean and strong audit report that uh, you know that we're able to present to you this evening. But I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone has on, on anything relating to the audit or the financial statements. Well, Very straightforward. It sounds like we're operating at a high level. We're doing a great job. Along the way. We're not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> we have the best business official. We have the best assistant. <laughs> <laughs> we have the best assistant. Not always going to be. No, it's a good It really is. And, you know, we only get to see it for a short period of time, and we're looking at what happened over the course of the year. So, but um, but again. I think you have a very strong team. You have a lot to be, you know, a, a lot to be proud of, and especially under the circumstances of how you are, you are having to operate now and what the future looks like. Um, at least you're positioned in a good spot to start, you know. But you know, we don't know where tomorrow is going to bring us. So, you know, unfortunately. But um, but as of June 30, you know, this is this is where we stand, and it certainly should be a very strong picture. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize also for the confusion. No. Uh,
coming or Zoom. Oh. We, we realized it would be been very difficult to manage live streaming you and the audience. I'm um, sure. I Listen, I would rather be in person. I, I would take this up any day <laughs> over Zoom or virtual. So I'm good. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Be well, everybody. Deborah, thank you for everything you did. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Deborah. That's an outstanding report. Right? It puts us in a good spot. It's a good spot for next year. Especially yeah. when we're going to be facing. So, you know, you pray for rain, that rainy days don't happen, but then you pray extra that you have what it takes to handle it. You give us that opportunity to start off with, and hopefully, you know, the governor has a little more you know, to help that out. So, thank you. Okay, so we can now uh, go for the status of the hybrid model. Okay, um, so actually, I'm going to open this up because I have some feedback. So we um, just wanted to, I'm going to ask Mrs. Heck to give a little report about how um, we're doing. Um, but uh, we also had um, put out, uh, initially when we uh, offered parents the option of uh, going full remote, um, we asked people to make a commitment to either keep their child out for planning purposes, either to the first marking period, and we use the high school date for the first marking period of um, the elementary schools or our trimesters. So we use December 10th as the date in order to be well prepared for um, students coming back, uh, making sure that we have uh, appropriate spacing, um, uh, the desks organized in a particular way, ordering any additional um, barriers that we need to order. We sent out a survey last week. We, uh, Friday was the deadline. Um, we sent it out to parents who indicated that they wanted their they wanted their children out through November 10th. There's also parents that opted to keep their children out until the end of the first marking period, which is the end of January. I mean, I'm sorry, end of the first semester, which is the end of January. So this survey went out to those parents. Um, we did not get all of the responses yet. Our parent coordinator is following up on uh, making personal phone calls to parents. But right now we have, um, I would say, uh, less than 50% of our students who uh, would like to come back. Um, depending upon the, the building and the grade level. So I think there's a total of about 135 students on remote. And this tapped into, um, I, I don't remember the exact number, but it was, um, I think it was the smaller percentage, right, Lee, of families that wanted the uh, first marking period. So it was about 30% of all of the students that were out and about half of those now are, we don't have all the data in, but um, it's not a very large number. We have 20 children definitely coming back at the junior senior high school. Uh, we have 16 that are pending. We have seven that are definitely returning to rain and six that are pending. And we have, uh, and these are non-responses. So it's not out of the whole full number. These are just non-responders yet. And we have six definite coming back to center with three families still in. So um, we think that's great that parents are feeling comfortable enough to want to send their kids back. I think there's various different reasons why parents choose to do that. Some are social reasons. Some are feeling a uh, feeling of things are going well. Um, you know, we did have the one case where we needed to close. Um, but we're no, I, I think we're in as good shape as any other district, at least across Long Island. Um, you know, it depends on the, the uh, area, the size, and a lot of factors go into it. But we've so far had only that one case. 
Uh, we have had some cases where family members um, had become ill, and so um, employees needed to quarantine, but those were contained and no one else was infected. Um, and so I think, you know, we are in good shape. Um, and so I'll just turn it over to Mona for a minute. Um, I, I think in many ways we are now sort of settling in with the school year. Um, there were so many unknowns as we began, um, but now we've gotten into a routine. The school looks a lot like school normally looked, and it looks a lot different than the normal looks. Um, we're right now at the in high school. It's very quiet. We've got using hoppers, and we have the in the building each day. Um, you know, it's a very different environment. I think. We talk a lot about how proud we are of our district, our faculty and staff, and, and we should be because there's a lot of reason um, to be. I think we've done this really, really well and very challenging. Um, and I don't think, as much as we've settled in, I think those challenges continue. Um, you know, having hybrid learners who are not in every day and having some fully remote learners who are not in at all um, is, is a unique challenge and it's a significant challenge. Um, especially when we start the school year that way, trying to create relationships um, and get into the routine of school um, with the challenges. But I, again, I think we should be very proud of what we're doing. School is moving forward. Um, instruction is moving forward. There's a lot of creativity going on. Um, and a lot of barriers and challenges have been overcome. But they see some of the technology challenges as much as we have. Um, terrific infrastructure for technology. There are daily glitches here and there, and um, we, we want to have access to all students at all times, and it doesn't always happen. But, but again, overall, I think we're doing a um, you know, really significant amount of work to make this work well, and, it, and it's going. Um, but we, we need to get students back in school eventually and get back to the normal school. But, but I think our teachers, our team, you know, everybody's really um, stepped up and has done a tremendous amount of work to make this, make this work. I think in, in, we meet regularly with the uh, teachers' union leadership, and I think it is hard for our teachers. I think they are struggling. Um, and I think one of the main reasons they struggle, and I say this all the time, is try not to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Because teachers want things to be perfect. They want their classrooms to run the way they've always run. They want to continue to do great things in their classrooms, to do cooperative activities, to work, have children work in groups, for them to meet in small groups, to individualize instruction. Some of those things are just not possible due to uh, due to COVID, due to the pandemic, due to the uh, you know health and safety restrictions and the social distancing that we have to. Um, Put in place, and, and that I think is what's challenging teachers. Um, of course, they want to know that they're connecting with all students, um, and, and that's hard. Um, we knew that our students who were on a full remote model um, would not be getting the same um, experience that children who were coming in on alternate days would be able to get because we can't replicate that. We cannot. It's impossible to replicate that one-to-one -one face to face instruction that we that our kids who are on the hybrid model can have every other day they, or every two days. They may not have it every day, but the teacher has a relationship with them when they are in the classroom. And when they are in the classroom, the quality of the instruction we know is better. It's it's present, it's personal, it's physically there there's just no uh, alternative for being physically present. We all know it because we've experienced all the Zoom meetings. And, and as Devolta just said, we like in person because you connect differently. And so um, it, it continues to be a challenge. Um, and thank you, Mona, for you know for outlining um, how things are going. Um, but we we are hearing um, and seeing that some districts are beginning to bring um, students back. Uh, Full time in you know bringing all students in and um, not having a hybrid model. You know that um, Kate Woodmere is working toward that. I don't know when that's going to start. 
um, Delaware Merrick has at their high school level, um, I believe also as an aside, the uh, Commissioner of Health, children go to um, Dr. Eisenstein, they go to Delaware Merrick, so I'm sure they're doing things well. Um, and we are looking into and speaking with those districts about how they um, how they did it, how it's going. Um, we discussed this, are discussing this with our teachers union. They had done an internal survey um, asking people how uh, safe they felt, teachers how safe they felt, and uh, on the Likert scale of uh, one to five, everyone answered, I don't have the um, exact numbers, but three and above, which is a good sign that the teachers for the most part feel safe in school. Um, and so uh, we we really want to look at if this is something that the board would like to explore. Our numbers are good and they're stable. Um, we know that you know in our neighboring district, Lawrence has um, had to close. I think that's a very unique situation that maybe um, is specific to the Lawrence community. Um, you know, I've been monitoring our numbers uh, on Newsday and uh, looking on the state website. There's now a uh, website where you can with the green, the um, yellow, orange, and red phases. It's a new, set, new designation for school districts uh, to determine whether you're not just districts but communities, whether you're in a red um, zone and what would happen if you are, if you're in an orange zone, what the restrictions are, and then a yellow zone. And we were just notified that. If a school district is in the yellow zone, we would need to, we're not clear how we would do that, but uh, do um, testing, uh, COVID testing with 20% of our student and teacher, student and staff population every week. Um, luckily, we're not, um, but there's on the website, it's great. You just put the address in and it says you have no designation. So I've been checking every day. Um, it gives you a quick response um, that we're in a good place. Um, you know, it's hard. You have to watch the numbers by now by community. And it's not by school district because, not like us, but some school districts span a couple of different communities. I know, you know, Baldwin is part of Oceanside, a little bit of Rockwell Center. You know, we're part of Lindbrook and part of East Rockaway, but, um, you know, we're pretty much uh, a smaller community. So, um, in order to do this, we would need to look at the costs associated with um, purchasing additional barriers, uh, what that would look like in the classrooms, um, you know, and again, wanting to get feedback from parents who we'll probably do the survey. I, I know we had discussed uh, last week when I met with our president, vice president about doing um, a survey uh, for our students and our uh, faculty, I'm sorry, students and our parents as to how they see things going uh, because we haven't, we haven't heard from them. We really wanted an opportunity to get things uh, up and running. It wasn't easy in the beginning, but as, as Mona just said, we now have a rhythm and, um, and although things are not perfect, they're pretty good. And uh, we want to see how parents are feeling, what their comfort level is. As, you know, as teachers were, teachers said, I should say, our union president said that our teachers are meeting with all students except for the remote students. They're just not meeting with them all the time at once. But they are meeting with all of the students except for the 130 or so that are on remote learning every other day. And so um, they are exposed and we are following the rules. And, and I have to tell you, the kids are unbelievable. Walk through the halls. I have never, never seen a kid, a um, student without a mask on. Um, they are terrific. But we have wonderful kids that follow the rules. They're, they've been, the hallways are, 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 they follow the social distancing as best they can. Um, you know, obviously it's easier with half the population in the building. Um, but um, we would like to discuss the possibility uh, if we wanted to consider more grades back. We have K3 right now. We know that in and of itself presents some challenges for teachers because we have one teacher alternating in two classrooms. That's an extra challenge for those teachers, literally going back and forth every day. And would we maybe start by collapsing those grades together um, and having sufficient barriers. Uh, schools, other districts are telling us that they're using 
um, about three feet, three to four feet, rather than the six feet when the barriers are in place. So it allows for uh, more students to be in the class. Would the barriers be required? Or is that just additional? They are. That we feel is a good idea. No, they are. So they are. They are. They're still, yeah, they have not relaxed the social distancing um, requirement. So the barriers are like a mitigate, it's a mitigating strategy to to mitigate the need for the six feet. Um, you know, the one thing the state has not done that um, uh, they've not designated by a, to my knowledge, and, and I could be wrong, but I've never seen it, a percentage the way restaurants and gyms do, 25, 50%. Um, so schools are not bound by that occupancy percentage, um, which is why some districts are bringing, well, able to bring all kids back in. Uh, we just don't have the space nor the personnel to split everyone um, in the way that we did with K-3 yeah. students. So it would be really the only way to go about it would be to purchase uh, the dividers. So we would probably have to use more desk barriers to look around from the last and possibly alongside what we have here in the high school cafeteria. So there's a part of the uh, rows of the floor, so the desk is going to be closer, so that we can collapse um, some of the sections that are divided into the floor. And that would be like the first step to see how that works, bringing all of these people to one classroom and teaching in one classroom. That's a normal situation. I think there were a lot of predictions that this wasn't necessarily going to work, and people were, you know, not taking real bets, but um, you know, how what would it be like? Oh, we're going to all be closed by October, and, and that didn't happen. Right? Right. We're not. We're yeah. No, I, I think we we need to start exploring the possibilities of bringing everybody back, and, and starting with the. Elementary or continuing, I really should say, because that's where we start. K through three is out every day. So if we try to continue with four, five, six and move that, we're getting a better read to things are starting. Hopefully, you know, where, where more confidence is gained every day. One one thing I think we all know that East Rockway does real well, and that's social emotional well being of people. But we know that if you're not here presently every day, Hard to really gauge that, you know. So, you know, I, I'm all for um, trying to see what it would cost us. Uh, again, hoping that our meetings with government officials will start bringing in again the elections coming up. I think we're getting closer to that election date. Maybe it'll be money released. If we're working on numbers this way and we're, we're gathering from the parents, from the from the students, from the teachers, you. How comfortable everybody is. Let's keep that moving so that the the tide is still moving forward, moving parallel. And then hopefully we'll get a big break, you know, and maybe we'll see the money come through, and then we'll be able to purchase everything we need to purchase. But at least we we have everything in place. Just look at it. Here's how I look at it. You did such a marvelous job, okay, getting us to where we were in September to open up the building. We want to still do that marvelous job moving forward, getting everybody back in. So if we sort of like just wander now and don't do our homework to do everybody, we're sort of like, you know, just saying, okay, we're good. But I think I think we can still move because there are districts out there that are moving in. So why not try it and see where we can we can move? If we don't have real numbers of all these weigh-ins that we're gonna look at, then we can't really guesstimate. But now we can really make a good estimate where we should be if we get all that. So I would I would encourage Lisa that. You, know, you continue to work in the past that you are that you just said okay with those three groups and then also jackie if you could continue i know it's, it's painstaking you know as I, I keep looking out this auditorium <laughs> and i'm saying to myself how did you figure out these numbers and every other row and this and that but the bottom line is we all know that we're here for one reason it's for kids and, and that's why you know it works that way so i, I would appreciate uh, i don't know how the rest of the board members feel yeah. so. So I'm <laughs> um, I think that one of the really important things
things also is making sure that as we are being transparent with all the parents and the, and the residents and everything is making sure we give the parents enough time to plan and organize with their work and their job and their schedules. And I'm sure it's not going to happen overnight, but at the same time, just maintaining that level of transparency so that the parents can plan accordingly. I mean, staying home from work and then traveling here, going there, it's a lot on the parents and everybody else and all of us, I'm assuming. So uh, I think that's super important. I mean, that traveling and everything really about what we're thinking and how we're going to do it and what the phasing process looks like. And like I said, I think the one major thing is probably going to cost, like the cost of what it's going to take. So hopefully we can move quickly and efficiently and uh, make this happen. Yeah. It's really the need of sense of the same and, I, and I think that's the great work that PTA can really get involved. If they want to get involved, the less meetings we have. I think this is a perfect time for them to really get involved. With and then a communication committee is coming in now. So we, we have a lot of things moving in this direction. Let's keep it moving. I think you know we, we knew that planning for any any of our students coming back was going, we needed time. We couldn't put that survey out and say, okay, come, are you coming back next week? Okay, come on in, because the classrooms needed to, we needed to make sure. At the high school, it's complicated. They go to nine different periods, and so every child, we have to look at those nine classes for every student and make sure that the capacity, you know, doesn't exceed, um, you know, the regulations with, you know, again, using the barriers as, as, as mitigation but and that's why um, we have those and now Jackie can start to work on ordering uh, barriers because they do have to be made they are custom made um, most of them and one of the versions if we go with the one that's here I've already reached out to the vendor and asked them would you use the material that we used to do just barriers that were used to yes the one was me if we're going to bring everybody into one classroom, the chances are the most classrooms will not be using that finally. That allowed us to have an inexpensive way to progress 50%. So the full percent were going to be the barriers. We signed the barriers. So we put in a call already to be able to see this evening to use some of the material we have to create the barriers. Working on that end too. Yeah. You know, just try it, and that's why it pays in to be good. We can buy some outright material and then put them in the classrooms and then take the old barriers off and send them out. And we've got to do it. Try to save money and yet address what we want. It's a great idea. And, and, and that will take time. And so that's the phasing that, that Mr. Volkers, that you're talking about. Right. It will happen naturally because we, we can't do it any other way. Right. I will say that I'm still very concerned, and I brought this up in my meeting with uh, on with Human Rights. I know Mr. Volkus, I think you're going to be meeting next week with her. Um, I'm very disturbed that the costs for the barriers, um, which were the highest costs that we sent you in the board update, are not going to be covered by FEMA. I think that's, that is incredibly unfair and unbelievable. Um, those are necessary emergency costs for us to educate our students. Um, the same thing with um, the foggers. Foggers. <laughs> like, like although they were not as expensive as the batteries, but a fogger, I mean, that's an essential, that's an essential piece of equipment that we need in each building in order to clean every day. We use those foggers every okay. single day in every single building. And so it's, I mean, in all three of our buildings. And, it's just, it's unbelievable. It's not acceptable. And so we, we have to really make that known and advocate um, however we can that these costs be covered. Um, we are at the suggestion of uh, Congresswoman Rice. Um, I have sent, it seems that the town of Hempstead had received um, a large amount of money um, and it was suggested to us that we forward some of those expenses to the town of Hempstead. Uh, for their evaluation of possible reimbursement. Um, I have taken the first steps to do that, to make sure that they're qualifying expenses. I haven't heard that yet, and we'll continue to pursue that um, for a possible um, you know, reimbursement of some of the funds. It's just a, a really, it's a tremendous burden for the local school districts to, um, to take on without any hope of 
you know, and it sounds great, our audit report was great, but how long will that fund balance sustain all of the costs that we're going to have for the program? So we will start looking into that. Okay, next on the agenda is the budget development process. Yes. yes, so I ended out a bunch of timelines. Does everybody have those with it? With you? Okay. Um, the only thing that I really changed, or shall I say I added, was just you know more than a discussion starting early. Usually we start, I have copies here, everybody can like them. Um, what I changed this year was we usually started the budget discussion in December. Um, and this, this year, obviously, we're starting in October for obvious reasons. Um, you see the highlighted ones basically go through the three areas that we're kind of starting everything with them. And that the business office always started in October, right after the audit, we start the budget. Um, but we didn't really start discussions here with the board or with the public until around December. Um, this year, I think it's important we start now. We start talking about the potential state aid cuts that they're talking about. Again, as you know, we see it's kind of money over the spring. We earmark that to get us through any difficulties that we may see in the, uh, the school year we're in right now, additional cuts to COVID, and the uh, potential state aid cuts. So that we wouldn't have to reduce any kind of program this year. It didn't make sense because we didn't know what would help for us in the spring. We still don't know what the future holds for us, but the economy is not doing really well, especially the state of New York. Um, so we want to start discussing this a lot earlier. So what I will be getting, we'll start to do now when I return next week, is um, I will roll salads. That means everybody's contractual salad will roll well. That's always my first step. And then I will report back where we are just rolling the salad. What does that mean? What kind of money? Because um, my concern um, is not the 2021 school year. My concern is the 21 22 school year. The meeting the program is always going to be a concern. Um, what does state aid look like next year? Um, will they freeze it at last year? Will that even freezing it is a problem? Because we rely on that state aid increase to help cover contractual increase. Because our tax cap doesn't necessarily cover a large amount of money. So I will be working on rolling the salaries and looking at the impact to the social security, the health insurance, all those things to actually take the amount in the month of November. Um, and then I'll start the study where the CPI appears to be falling and kind of come up with an estimate of what kind of additional revenue we could possibly um, get from uh, tax levy. But Really, nobody really knows what the state's going as far as state aid. And there's a lot of fear out there that we will not get an increase in state aid and we will get a decrease in state aid in 2022. Um, that is what our fund balance and our reserves will be used for to help maintain the program. But we need to stop the talk about it. It's going to be a really difficult year. So that's where you see that the budgets will be going out next week to the uh, buildings and the administrators. Various departments. <clears throat> I've asked for them to give it to me before the holidays so that we have a holiday recess to look at it. Um, and January is our first work session, but we will be discussing at least five or ten minutes each work session forward to just give you an idea of the different. Um, yeah, different. Yeah. Like actually, where we are. Okay, here we are with all the salaries, your own benefits. This is where we are. We do so much um, and then hopefully I'll have an interview with somebody who will have a really good idea where we are with our CPI and our next step increase. Jackie, are you going to start with a rollover with the uh, administrators for next year, or are you just going to say, you know, it is what it is because how, how can they come in with budgets that, you know, do the work with things that they conceive might need, or they might need, but it's going over even more? So, are they going to roll over from last year? Well, with the building projects, it's based on enrollment numbers as per the US OE guidance. So, each, each uh, building is um, allocated a certain uh, amount of money per student. So, we use the same dollar amount. Okay. So, based on the enrollment, their budget is based on that. So, it's 
So in the two elementary buildings in Oakland have to pay significantly. So both of them probably need more work. The high schools most like to decrease slightly, though it'll be slightly higher. Um, the departmental budgets, like the athletics budget, um, his coaching salaries and stuff does not really go like his budget because his salaries is outside. Um, but the other parts of the budget will be given as a rollover. And then if there's needed money due to some kind of contractual increases, then we will have to. Everybody's going to be asked to keep it flat to the best of their ability. Yeah. Generally, that's how you start out. So I always, and everybody writes a wish list, and Jackie mm -hmm. keeps the wish list. Right. I always have a wish list, and then we add things and go subtract them, or if there's some things that we could afford this year, we can buy them. Um, you know, so this year we may not, that, that wish list may remain intact as a wish list. You know, each year we try to. Yeah, everybody will be asked to remain flat, departmental, unless there's a contractual obligation in which they can't find dollars. That's great. Thank you. And, and thank you for, again, being proactive, getting us out in front uh, the best we can as we see things unroll from the government side. Money might come in, might not come in. At least we're ahead of the game to make the adjustments at the end that you're so good at. So thank you. Today's prime day. Maybe the CPI will go up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe that's what it is. <laughs> well, we're helping now. Prime <laughs> day. Everyone else is just arriving daily. Yeah. yeah. With very good vibes today. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, we have the state controls report for extra costs and activity funds. The report examination number 2020M-85. So we ended this out last um, last week, we a review. Um, it was about a year and a half now. So we had the office of the state controller that required us that they would be doing an audit. They do an audit every three to five years in the school districts. So it was our turn. Um, and what they do is they come in and they sample um, each financial area of the school district, um, and then determining after they look at it and they see what they what they feel whether it was substantiated, any kind of expenses, and what kind of risk factor based on each area is going to be pulled. What they determine is what area they're going to look at further based on risk assessment. And they determined that the Student Activity Fund was the highest risk in their um, analysis, which I think is a, a, a tremendous uh, outcome. It shows that the other areas in the school district um, they didn't feel was at high, as high a risk. Jackie won't take the credit, but that's really significant because they don't come in like the internal auditors do and pick an area on a cycle to look at. They come in and look at everything and they test all the areas. And so just the fact that this was the only area they found that was at risk or a risk area is, is really significant. We had um, an audit, uh, I think it was my second or third year here, and it was also not terrible but we had some more significant areas that were of concern so i think this is just this in of itself is really something to, to congratulate jackie on that this was the only area that they identified to look at so they, they did look at it um and they look at it for a two-year period 17 18 18 19 was their four years um 17 18 the, the student activity account Fund was not an area that my office had looked at. You know, I started in late 2016. Um, so we had identified that that was an area we knew we needed to strengthen the controls. And so we put a bunch of new procedures and kind of controls in place for the 1819 school year. So this basically covered one year of which it operated of the old procedures and one year of which it was starting the new procedures and protocols. So uh, they were here for several months, maybe eight or nine months. And, um, and then they go back to their office and they start to prepare their reports. And usually what happens, I've been to several of these orders in the past, is they will sit with us and they will go over what they call their reception list um, with my, myself and my, uh, my team and show us what they found. Um, because of COVID, that didn't happen. So the first thing we, first time we saw the exceptions was when we all got this report last Um so you'd see that there was quite a bit of exceptions on uh, backup for money collected. Um, so what we did is we asked them to identify each and every uh, deposit that they had pulled and earmark was an exception. 
Um, what we found was 75% of the ones that the 102 that they identified were in the 17, 18 school year, which did not surprise me. The 18, 19 though did surprise me. So what we did is we pulled the archive because we don't we don't have enough room in the district to store all records. Our records go to our storage facilities. We pulled the 18, 19 records. Um, each and every one that was identified, and we found uh, several discrepancies. Um, we didn't feel that they were inadequate, um, and so we contacted the state patrol's office and said, you know, we don't see what we've done wrong, and that's a problem because obviously we continue to do it wrong because the us is one. So we'd like a little further discussion. Um, so we pulled the packs together, and the uh, control, uh, the order that the patrol's office came picked up the packet and started to reveal them himself so that we can both dis we can discuss with the district and the order to see if maybe there was uh, some misunderstanding or if we have to change what we're doing because clearly what they've selected is what is part of the practice and we have the, our own internal auditors assist us with developing yes. all those procedures. And they are procedures that I've used in many years in the prior district. They have passed the Office of State Patrol has ordered in the past. I, I think it might have been a little bit of a confusion. It had to do with um, triple press number of receipts. You saw that written up? And yes, we think that every time we receive cash, we issue a triple click uh, receipt so that the number is in the receipt book and it's it attached to the deposit. But we don't do that when we receive checks because we have copies of every check. Um, so if we got, you know, 15 checks, there was no copy of the receipt because we don't give the receipt for a check. We don't feel it necessary. The check is the receipt. Um, and that's the procedure we've been following all along. And that's just an old, significant number of the exceptions for only checks. So we've got a little bit of a um, discrepancy as to what we feel was a little bit exception. And the lead auditor said that he would like to look at it himself and he maybe he should just mail so we haven't had the exit interview. Um, what obviously is only draft. It will remain draft until we have an exit interview, and that exit interview will be uh, delayed at this point until they finish going back to what will be. I did not look at 1718. Um, it could have been if some of those other ones could have been in the 1718 too as well. But at this point, I use 1718 was something that I need to have reviewed, and I really was concerned that our new procedure. That we've been following now, this is our third year, for the right procedures. Um, so I really focus on that. That's where we all set. So the, the two things they have recommendations is really what I want to talk about tonight. Mm -hmm. You know, they have the faculty council and the faculty order that they're recommending. What, what, what's your view on that, Jackie? Yeah. Um, we had what we had faculty advised, not we didn't have both in my life. Actually, my two five years, we didn't have a faculty. Um, well, faculty treasurer that oversaw and took in and kept their own records. I mean, I do believe that each club should have their own records, but that is a part of being one, and the advisor should be teaching the children to maintain their records. But we did, in my prior traditions, I did in fact have one in the building that everybody reported to as opposed to coming. Business office kind of gave that second layer of. Um, is this like a second person to oversee? You know, oh, sir, in that role. Uh, a teacher. So With we had. A yes, they got a they got stipend because they were both districts, both my boys. They were larger districts, but they both did have stipends. Back. And that person was the go to person. Um, all the advisors would go to them, and everything would be through them, and then they would be also tracked. Us, and we would all be comparing. We'd be comparing our records to their records. We each have our own set of books. The order was both sets of books um, to make sure we were in sync. The reports were verified. We do have monthly reports that we send to the clubs from my office, but we would compare the faculty advisor with, with the monthly report that they would sign off that would come from us each month. And then that faculty advisor would then deal with each individual. And each building would have a faculty advisor, or you had one for the whole district? We had, in my prior district, we had one at the middle school and one at the high school because we had two separate buildings. 
Um, we never had one of the elementary buildings, but that wasn't necessary. Um, in the district before that, two high schools, one of the high schools. So it was really here we don't need one. Much smaller. One per building and secondary buildings. Jackie, is, are these recommendations requirements? No, no recommendations. So we, if we decide to handle that in a different way, it's not, it's not it's something not, we'd be citing it's not for. No, absolutely not. The, the one thing I do like is that one of the things that everybody understands, and, and because in athletics we used to do a lot of fun things, and rules have changed as my thought. But the one thing that really hurts anybody doing this is the fact that all of the work that the coach or moderator of the club has to take on besides do the good work with kids. And it takes away from the good work with kids all the time. So when I saw this, you know, and I know that when I worked in the city, one of the things we had was called the COSA. And I, you know, they took the first one, they had somebody up at Mountain. And I think it's money well spent in the fact that if you had a faculty advisor, faculty council, whatever you want to call it, that was the one that was now taken from all of the clubs and everybody in there. It makes the traffic in the business office lower. It makes the traffic for the coach or moderator lower because they have somebody now who's a suit in the area and is taking a real vested interest because they're getting a little stipend to do it also. So, you know, one of the things I'd like the board to think about for the future is, you know, as we're going through this, and Jeff gives us more from the actual order itself, is that, you know, maybe something we should consider to lessen the load on. Uh, those moderators and, and coaches who are doing a, a yeoman's job already and trying to get the extra for the kids. And there's always extra. We always, everybody wants the fan. We all want, you know, these Rockway Rocks and the labels and stuff. And it's all good, but it really does become very, very time consuming. And, and, and Jack, you know, it's, it's a difficult task a lot of times for your office to constantly go after those reports and get them in and so on and so forth with everything else. That I mean, the monies, you know, we've looked at those three years of money. They're, they're hard monies. Yes. It's a lot of money that comes in. It's a lot of money. So to me, it justifies having somebody who, because you have board, what is coming in, who is really versed in it. How do you guys feel about that? It'd be someone who's in the site. No, no, no. I was just going to say, is it, would, would you choose from someone who's currently working in the district? That's right. 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 That's what can you explain? I mean, it, it sounds like it's being slightly a little different than what I'm used to. Can you explain what the person does when you're talking about an hour and that, that we share this about us? So it is a business teacher, and mm -hmm. basically, all the clubs, anytime they have money, that I can only speak to what I see here, but so here, but we have money coming in here, but. And now the money has to be turned into the business office. He gets all the money and collects it, meets with the person in charge of that club or that sport, and they have to fill out, I guess, a certain type of a receipt. And then he brings everything over to the business office, and he is basically the intermediary. So everything is done. So that's how I know the back advisor. So that the, uh, the money doesn't go, the money is collected, but the student treasurer or the student yeah. did. Because the club has to be involved. Because that's a requirement yes. for yes. the charter of the club, yes. is that they have to be responsible. Right. And the kids are learning how to match right. that. And now the children are always in our office. Exactly. We, we always have the children and the advisors a lot of times when the children don't understand them in our office. And yes, and they bring their paperwork in. So instead of coming to us, they come to the faculty advisor. Right. So it's right. exactly right. that. Right. It's, uh, you need money for your class to go get buy decorations. Why not? You need to put that request in. It goes to him. He goes to the business office and then comes back. So he's there to advise the student. Yes. You know, the paperwork's not complete. You need to do X, Y, and Z. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then he will send it over. And, exactly. and, and, it, and it, it gets done in a more timely and it's no, no, you know, <laughs> negative on your office because you're doing a million things, but it's done in a more timely basis. But guess what? They hunt that person down the hall because, you know, they find that they want to get that movie. So, it works a lot more smoothly in the transition. I can find out. I can look at my teacher contract and it's 
see um, what the site is mm -hmm. for that position. Oh, and I can reach out to you, the person that's doing it. He's asked for more job description if you happen to have one. So he was going to reach out to um, the public advisor and see if he, like the overall public advisor, and see if he had um, a job description. And there, just so we have something to look at in comparison. Is that also an easy for your office dealing with one person as opposed to oh, yeah. oh absolutely. So, absolutely. Like, yeah. there's, there's a lot of activity in the business office. Sure. Right. So, you know, it's very crowded and you know, now we have to staying at home and it does get very it does get very crowded at times. Mm -hmm. um, and that is it sounds like exactly how I function in my past two And then that person is working on it. That would be all everything is Exactly. Is that an hourly? No, it's a stipend. Okay, we'll Athletic Complex, Baby Stone, what were the fundraisers? Well, this is an easy one, I think. Um, Mr. Barth came to us with the idea as we developed the new athletic complex that at the entrance way, which you also have pictures of, which was beautiful, um, it's going to be beautiful, the renderings were lovely, um, that we create a brick pathway where people can purchase the bricks and have them engraved. Um, kind of as a fun, would be a fundraiser, but it would also add to the aesthetic beauty of the, um, and, and I think people would take a lot of pride in that. Um, so, if the board is in agreement with that, uh, Mr. Brillo said that he would incorporate that into the design. And um, as we get closer, you know, we can start to share that and share the renderings out and start to fundraise uh, for that. People can buy a brick, have someone's name put on it, um, and really enhance the beauty as well as the significance for people in the community of the, the new athletic company. Well, yeah. 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 I think that you're going to have a lot of bricks that people yeah, yeah, right. we're probably going to need yeah. a little bit of help this community. Yeah. You know, what we had talked about with the PTA um, in my old district, they did it in the front. They had um, like a, a concrete area, much like you know, we have the grassy areas, we have the path, but we do have opportunities to expand it. So, we had talked to the PTA about it, and the high school PTA was, was interested, and then I'm not really sure, it kind of just fell off the radar. But, um, you know, that's also, if we wanted to do that simultaneously, you know, if, if you see that there's a huge interest, kind of the overflow might be that maybe people want the, the brick, it, it could be in the oval, anywhere. That would be significant and, and not limited to just athletes, it could be in any part of, of the school. Um, and it's really not that hard to do. Um, you can take up some, rather than break up the concrete, take away some of the grass, you know, not huge parts of the grass, but small parts of the grass around around the walkway or on the walkway. So I, I really think knowing this community, it would have a lot. I, I think everybody would want to break. It's like the, uh, the chairs in the auditorium. Uh, so. What would the funds go towards? Well, that would. Um, if you ask Mr. Barr, I'm sure the athletic program. Uh -huh. I think the music, if we expanded it, you know, and considered other locations, it could go to other, you know, it could go to the school, it could go to you know, divide it up, scholarships, right. Yeah. You know, I think it would, that, we didn't even get that far because we wanted to know if the board was interested. Right. Yeah, I think anybody would have played on that field would buy it, right? Exactly. 100%. They did this at that day, when they brought like the field day, and it was a sellout within weeks, and they have a real big one now. Real big one. So I, I think it's a great idea. Okay, great. So this just came in. I thought I would share it with you. Um, these are two renderings uh, that Mr. Grillo sent over today. So I thought maybe you wanted to pick up on There's two different ones with each piece, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah
And I think there's other features that you probably do better as well. How do you feel about that orange pulse of the infield in the base? I know I keep looking at it. That's scary. It's a scary thing. <laughs> yeah, we'll go ahead. Uh, what, what I agree. That? So you have the orange here that would run, though, and you see where it's running right through your, your baseball infield, and it's running right here. So the softball's not bad, it's on the outskirts. Yeah, fine. Yeah, I see. Yeah. But baseball really is going to be right in the middle, smack in the middle. I would almost leave the end zone fine, but the out the outer side. And yeah, just, we talked about that like coach black that should go too. We did it that. So this. So you would want this cut to end there and there, and then this all be clean. Correct, so yeah. The way this orange line yep. And the white line. Yep. And then uh, my opinion also would be that the rocks in the end zone will be black off with white. Yeah, yeah. Black, yeah. black and orange, but not black and white. Yeah, personal thing. Black would be, his white black would be better too. I don't know if it's good, and maybe you guys know better. The reflection of a baseball on a black background versus an orange, what, what do you think of that? Uh, no. Is there a difference in that or is it really the same? You know? I'm just trying to figure the contrast because again, that end zone, you see what the end zone runs, right? You're running right into the first, right over for a base. Yeah. Right over it. You know, I'm thinking that is is it I don't know. I don't know what to say with that. Could that be filled during the season? Could that be painted? No, that's not a bad thought process either. No. Being able to try and switch those specific little pieces somehow, you know, during the uh, in season. You mean pick up the turf, and but then aren't you also going to have the cross plane there? You will. So then, if you had pieces picked up, you're losing a part of the cross field. No. Well, the field itself we run with these ones here, so that's the field itself. So. We just talked about the paint in here. The fill paint. So the fill paint is 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 a thing that I would be concerned about. Did, did Mr. Boss have each yet, Lisa? Uh, he they were bailed out today, uh, just late this afternoon, and he did not weigh in yet. When we want to get some weigh in from them and then look at it again. I mean, I love the end zones. It's just I, I love them too. Yeah, like the guy that happens there, right? Yep. But I, I'm just wondering, Joe, if like during the course of the football season. Right, that that couldn't be painted orange, leaving it the white, and just being painted orange or, or black, whatever you want. You know, with regular field paint. Season's over. It's not there for the spring because it wears right off. You know, and well, that's how it works on field turf. It, yeah, they can they can match the orange. And, you it's know, a good idea. They do that on field turf. Uh, the Giants look at the Giants' jets, right? When they turn that field over, yeah, yeah, you're, you're you know, constantly painting back over. Yeah. So that's a good idea. If that's uh, that's but, an option. Why don't we let David, you know, and, and really weigh in since he hasn't seen it? It's really not fair. Maybe they make these. Uh, he saw it. I mean, he just he did, didn't answer. Didn't answer didn't yet. Yeah, but I didn't maybe, want to miss the opportunity to share with you. Maybe him and the coach could weigh in. Oh, you, you have all concerns, right? Yeah. Yeah. I know I tell them to get it. I was wrong. Now I get it. It's the it's the, yeah, it's this field here and, and yeah, the way this exactly. yeah. 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 first face first, 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 first. first. Yeah, I get it totally. I didn't realize you could even paint it. I'm thinking, yeah. I was still stuck on the what we were going to do here. I figured we would just be marking that during football season. Because you need, right? Don't you need to know where the, the lines are, you know, where the field is. Right, but they sew them in, so they right. sew all of that in. Right, right. right. But this you would do even in football season. You would just run that in. Right. That's what I was still thinking about. <laughs> I kind of get it. Yeah, that's a nice we can't pull out you and slate it. It's too hot. I just don't want to get wrong. I just don't want to take the play. How about the D-fields, Eric? Brown or John? It's going to be orange. That's the other orange, right? Where the cutouts are, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, that'd be the same 
Fine. Yeah, that would be the same old idea. Yeah. Yep. Right. Okay. It's coming along. But with 19 heroes recognition. So I know we had talked about um, this, um, you know, being at the, the conversation came out of board recognition night and you feeling you would like to recognize others. And so we brought it back to the whole administrative team. They all felt, um, to be honest, a little uncomfortable with um, selecting one or two people and highlighting them because they feel that everybody really did an outstanding job and everybody went out of their way and people are continuing to do that. And, you know, sometimes singling people out can make other people feel uncomfortable. And um, so we talked a little bit about it. Um, what else, how else could we do it? Um, and it was suggested that we maybe go um, and ask each unit to pick someone and I got some feedback on that and they felt equally I didn't speak to all the units but I spoke to a couple of units and they said well that may not go so well either and so um, I had thought that maybe and again we don't have to do it next week because it doesn't have to be the same time you know COVID is still going on hopefully it'll go away soon but um, maybe you know just one night recognizing in general all of the groups um, by either asking each of you to say a few words about the custodians, the teachers, the, the group. I, we can certainly help you with that. And, um, you know, recognizing all of them and, and being specific as to why they're heroes um, and doing, you know, a small speech. Um, we talked about the possibility of, um, I, don't, I left my name today. Do you have your Jimmy badge? No, oh, no. Why don't I get it? I have them to see. Oh. Am I going to get a Jimmy badge? I don't have to be used to. You know, have them, you know, how they did the flip grid um, type of thing, mm -hmm. video and stuff. Have them do something like that where they're the ones talking about it. You know, making it look like they're the right assignment and then do that type of thing. So that would be a kind of thing. Yeah, it's a good idea. I love it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Outside looking in, they, I like it. I love it. Yeah, I love it. You know how you opened school year, remember last year? Yes. Going you know, to kids? Yeah. It was power. I love that. It was power. Yeah, it was they just... all presented. They, all, they had a teacher's name on that, on them. And they, you know, they presented. That was their teacher. That was who they, you know, the role model, you know, and they, they talked. It was, it was really it was powerful. Good. You know, quick right. statements, they weren't yeah. all long and lengthy, just real quick, and the more the better. Um, but I love that idea. Yeah. I love that idea. Yeah. And they, they could do that, um, even, you know, as far as like, doing some, uh, I don't want to use the word, you know, like a spot commercial, but it's uh, PSA. PSA, thank you. That's the word. Like PSA. You know, some exactly. guidelines to give them. And they do their own PSA on their own phones, and they just send them all in. And straighten together and, and again, I think it would be nice to say that the Board of Education has, you know, asked the students to put this presentation together. So you are recognizing, you know, it's the board's recognition because it was your idea. So it was the board's, it's the board's recognition of, and this is how we're, we're demonstrating. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hopefully, we'll see. I will I'll we'll see if we can do it November, not November by December. Let's do it like after the election. <laughs> <laughs> Our next meeting is after the election. <laughs> <laughs> we'll repeat that. Wow. That's insane. All right, snow day pilot. We knew this was all coming. No. Okay. Was all coming. Okay. However, so we talked about this, and it, although it sounds like a wonderful idea, it sounds like a great idea. Um, th what would be necessary for us to do this is for every single student to have a device. Because we have, we don't, because we have K through 3 coming in, the only K through 3 students that have a device at home are the remote students. So um, we would actually then have to distribute, because we don't know when we're going to have a snow day. We can't anticipate it. We wait till the last minute. We call. We're up at 4 a.m. The superintendent's group making a decision on the phone. And so we don't know. We always try not to, to 
we try as hard as we can, especially ocean science, to hold that all the time. Um, her board is tough. <laughs> that doesn't uh, want a snow day. And so it, it would be really difficult to plan for. When we thought, when we had the first closure in high school, and we went to remote learning, we discussed what would happen if we had to close one of the elementaries. Because of that reason, the K-3 do not have a um, device at home. And so we did a survey to see how many families, um, how many families have device have devices at home on their own that they would be able to use that they wouldn't need to deploy or we would need to deploy a device for them and out of uh, the parents who responded there were there were 256 parents that responded uh, and 153 indicated that they have devices for their children and 40% said they do not have a device for their child because if we were to go full remote on a snow day, one device would not be enough. The kids in 5 through 12 or 4 through 12 now that have devices would be on their device all day because you would assume it would be like a regular remote day. You would go period by period and instruction would occur all day long except for lunchtime. And so they would need to be devices. Um, my husband's office is, um, he works for a big law firm, and they, I always ask him for the tasks that he can give us. He's given us a lot of furniture through the years, um, all of Jackie's office, my chairs, and they donate a lot of things. Um, so they're going to be donating, I say, three of them, three devices. We're going to pick up the first group of devices. Um, so we will have backup devices because we were not sure when the Chromebooks were going to come. And if we did need to close down, we didn't have enough devices to give to every K-3 student. So luckily, we've not had to close school, but there would be, we figured we did have about 100 devices on hand. But these devices will be picking up um, little by little and getting the first group on Friday who really help us. Um, but do we just give everyone a device and let it sit at home in the event of a snow day? Um, and I'm just surprised that the state education department is considering this because today we were discussing it. Is I mean, upstate uh, Betty Rosa, I don't know if you if you read the update. Their priorities um, for the state education department is equity in the digital divide, and so. Clearly, there's still a digital divide of state, and they are the places that have a lot more snow days than we do, and they do not have digital equity. Uh, they don't have, uh, everybody does not have Wi-Fi, and every district does not have a device that's been deployed. So I don't think um, it's necessarily a priority for us. Um, our teacher's contract requires uh, us to make up snow days, a um, certain amount of snow days. And we have a lot of days in our calendar. So you know, we have 182 days in our teacher's contract, and we always have to find a place to take off a few days. Some districts, uh, like Jericho, is 186. Most districts have 183 or 184. In our last contract, um, we, we did try for more days, but instead of more days, we got maybe up the snow days. So. Um, if we call a snow day in February, we just have one less holiday in, in May when it's a critical time, right, before the regions. So um, I couldn't see us deploying all of those devices to sit in people's homes um, and then not being able to anticipate um, a snow day. You know, if, we, if we close, we will make sure people have devices and we will have time. You know, even if like we close on the dime, the next day people can come in and pick up devices. In a snow day, we can't do that. Although we did ask Lee to go out on the sled. I mean, <laughs> his dog driven sled, would he consider, I mean, you know, if he does everything else, would he consider <laughs> delivering devices? But we thought that might be good. So um, we're not recommending these. I'm very happy about that. Right. Is there something to be said for kids to have that one snow day? Sure. We haven't had one in like years. Right, exactly. So but when you get that call, you just can go outside and play in the snow and leave it, leave it to the kids. And I feel like so much is taken away from them. If they get a snow day, they should go out and enjoy it. Change the one day a year they love. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing better than that. Right. <laughs> the, kids, the teachers, when I go in the, in the classroom to visit some kids, they go, this is the lady that decides who comes to the kids are like, ah. Oh. The elementary kids are so happy. Yeah, I don't think we're ready at this point in time to really say we can actually do this without trying to rush out of these devices. Yet. Now, the ones haven't come in yet, so why don't we delay that in the future and next year look at it again? Totally ready. Sounds good, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Jennifer. Use of district logo. Okay, so um, this uh, Jackie has received. Um, a request from an individual who lives in the north of our school district, um, who is an entrepreneur. She has a small business, and she is um, she's been contacting Jackie repeatedly, asking for um, permission to use our logo on tie dye masks because she's made them for other places, and people have asked her, and she would like our permission to use our logo on those masks and sell them. Um, we, it benefit the school? That's, we're not recommending it. The question is changed. I was going to say, she was going to get it. That would be a good thing. I'm going to do that. Right. But right now, she is <laughs> it's really, I think, uh, an entity, a, a private entity, that she's asking to use our logo so that she can sell them to individual families. And I think it would cut into our fundraising opportunities. Absolutely. We don't know enough about the person to adopt a bid. They have some years from the background. It just sounds like who they can sell one to. Yeah, uh, yeah. 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 So there was, you know, we did consult with our attorney because we always do to try and do our due diligence. It was a very convoluted answer. We possibly can do it. I just don't think we should do it. Um, it's not I think it was not right because it's not going to benefit the district. And to enter into some kind of a business agreement with her, where she would, I, I think that would be cumbersome, more work for Jackie. And, uh, you know, yeah. which law say sorry? Yeah, yeah. that's it. Right. Okay, so we're going to tell her now. Okay, thank you. Um, but we, did, right. we did want you to be there. Thank you. Transportation. So I, I, I did. Um, let you know a couple of weeks ago we brought up Nathan. We had found um, only four families, three families, four children that were riding the bus um, to St. Agnes. Um, I knew the person working in the business office for the transportation. And you know the applications come in April. We were all on uh, remote. And what she did when she got the applications was, you know, in my fault. Absolutely, because I have no idea that say and this half of the students, you know, have some areas within our district boundaries are less than two miles. So um, what you do is check, do we transport to say and this? Yes, we do. And then she ran the transportation. Um, only for it to be brought to our attention by another person um, in the district that did not get transportation because they did not apply for it because they were aware that they were not eligible. So brought to our attention, we of course looked into it, and then we went ahead and checked every child, um, and we did find three families. I did notify them. Um, they all received notification. I haven't heard from the family yet. Um, we didn't meet until the end of October, enough time for them, because legally we cannot transport. It did not cost the district any money, because they were on a, uh, a route that I paid for the van. Um, route. So it didn't cost us any additional money, but we can. So I just want you to know in case somebody came up to you and said, you know, we apologize, we now have a better procedure in place. And I'm a little bit more familiar with the fact that we have some schools. I mean, we actually have two schools that we transport to. Some students, in the, um, some addresses in the district. Are less than two miles, and some are not. Jackie, when you say we can't do it, um, is that because of our two mile restriction and use of taxpayer funds? Is that true? I just want to know if somebody did. We don't have the legal authority due to the um, the court policy. Yes, okay. the taxpayer funds. Once the board policy specifies something, we don't have the legal authority to override 
what has been, because transportation is approved by vendors, I mean the residents, so we don't have to prove what our overarching. Is there any liabilities to the end of the month that they're still on our bus? Like, after if something happens, there's no like, legal liability? No, no they're not like allowed. That. We're allowed, you know, we found the error, we notified them in writing, we gave them the right to appeal, and um, we're fine because we are covered insurance Okay, yeah, yeah. You know, but it didn't make, you know, they had gotten it in September. It only made sense to give them a couple of weeks to give them the opportunity to apply because we were notified back in the spring that they were eligible. We didn't have enough time to apply for them. And normally, wouldn't we have somebody that goes over those uh, tools so to make sure that, you know, the ones who are outside that radius? Well, what, what you news, well, what happened before we got the new person? She knew because before I knew which school districts had red had addresses that were partially within a two mile radius. So the new person in my office and me would did not know that uh, all lady piece is one of them and uh, St. Agnes, of course, I knew that. Anyways, but those two schools, some of our residents are over two miles and some of them are not. And that's where the problem goes. As we brought the applications in, she checked, did we transport to the school? If it was no, we never transported to the school, she then ran the mile. But this time, she looked at, oh yeah, we transferred to St. Agnes with seven kids last year, and she granted it, not realizing, yeah, we may have said seven kids, but this particular address is qualified for the two miles. It's the same thing with the maximum, which is 15 miles, and so if you live in the north end of town, you might qualify get transportation to a particular school, but if you live all the way down by the water, that can make a big difference and you wouldn't qualify because you could exceed the 15 months. So it's, it, it, it can be, especially, if, and, it, and it is, you know, it's it's a lesson learned by myself, um, Nassau County is so much more than them. It's three miles, but we'd still be in the same district. Because the county is so spread out. Nobody two miles close, unless you live in the same. Now we learn. We now know where all the schools are. She went through every single student regardless, ran the um, the mileage and attached it to the application and now the decision. We learn slowly. Does not happen again. Good part was no cost of the district, which is that was a good part. <laughs> And the last item on the agenda is superintendent's evaluation tool. We had asked for that to be put on before the last time we met for the work session. We had just sent out the uh, school board evaluation and really didn't have the opportunity to look through that and see how that would be. You also would just be indoctrinated into our present evaluation system for the superintendent. And uh, just wanted to know if there was any feedback on that for the board members of the school board's evaluation, right, uh, versus the present way we're doing the evaluation. And is that something that you would rather wait a full year and your turn coming, you know, as new board members to see this year through, like Kristen and Pete saw it last year, um, but you, you guys have it. So really just feedback to see what direction. I read through both of them, and again, I don't, and I went through the first process. The boards one seems a, not, I don't want to say easier, but a little more defined as to what we're looking for, as opposed to what you guys are using. But I'm, I'm fine with it. But so like, the boards one gave you a subject, and, you know, it gave you a listing of what was going on, and, you know, adequate, and it gave you a whole outline. I just seen, again, I don't want to say easier, just more defined. Correct, and that actually allowed the superintendent to choose those areas. Right, and she's defined them with them, but she sets his goals that year and then puts them in. But again, I just, I'm fine with people. I feel the same way. I, I, I'm fine either way. The other one does seem a little bit more defined. Um, whatever you guys feel is the best as most of your educators. Uh, you yeah. Like I said, we, it's the first time doing it, we'll follow you. Know, so whatever you guys would rather, to be honest with you. So Pete and Kristen, you guys have gone through it. You know, I'll go with myself. What do you think? I like a rubric based because I like to see what's going on. Um, I like to see what's going on. 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 I like to see what's
but I, I want to do what you feel comfortable with as well. Um, you know, what you can have to do, what you can I, I think this is more reasonable because the other one had so, was so onerous. There were many elements. This has five areas, I think, with different components. I would, would like to maybe sit down and go through it with president, vice president, and maybe pick which might be relevant. My only concern this year is um, with COVID, it seems so much has been, it may not happen the way you know, we're trying very hard to keep talking. We I mean, we have this conversation every Monday. We have to get to the regular work. Yeah. Yeah. The regular work. Yeah. Every time we try to talk about that, it's, you know, there's, you know, just, of course, I've asked our building administrators write um, action goals and um, department strategies, you know, their, their smart goals, and they submit their action plan. And a lot of that is, it's, it's, I mean, not a lot. All of it is based on a strategic plan and then, you know, any other specific areas that they would like to focus on, but everything really relates to the, um, you know, to the strategic plan. So we do have that. We're hoping, I'm hoping to resurrect, you know, to go back to that committee in November. If we're still, you know, things get a little better, we'll meet uh, in here if we have to. If not, we'll, we'll just... I'll meet with both our subcommittees uh, remotely and, and work that way. But I really think the strategic plan needs to be updated. But my reservation with that is that we don't have any data. And the data is so important. It, it's, not, it's not important to rate the teachers, but it's so important to set our goals. Um, where are we? And you know, we've started to talk uh, amongst ourselves um, about the idea of a, a blue ribbon school or applying for um, other types of recognition, and that's where the data really is is critical. I mean, sure. we can't we can't apply for those things without data. So I I would only be a little concerned this year in that I don't know where COVID's going to go and setting goals that we may not be able to achieve because I also don't want to put um, too much pressure on everybody who's just right now are just trying to keep their heads above water to be frank. And you know, keep things going. So, um, what I'd be happy to sit with you both and talk about it. I don't want to be averse to it. I, I think this is a better option than the super eval. I, I think that you just had a good idea. Maybe um, during the course of this year, five areas. If we took one area per, you know, work session and just bounced around the ideas, take that one area, bounce around the ideas, so that we're developing it, and as you're developing. Everything else is looking for the data driven where we work and all the time. You know, I do agree with you, it's a managing part right now. Goals oriented stuff at this point in time takes back seat to managing the health and safety and welfare of every student, you know, the teacher in the district. So there's no doubt it's not a good time to put this in you know? um, I would like though if we can continue conversation because I, I just think that the school board one is so much more um, it's accurate in, in the sense of, of looking at a vision and realizing that vision in in a format of like a tool, you know, very simple to that. And we don't have to, there's no money involved, it's right. zero cost. It's, it's a form the right there, <laughs> zero cost there, and it was just a lot. So I, I think you guys got to go through this year too, I in all fairness to you, because you'll see when we start putting that together. You know, it's quite a bit of research that you go back on your notes and you know, meetings to get the data to put in there. But of course, you know, I, I think we're in a good spot then too, if we all can agree that you know, work on a different course this year, work sessions, or maybe the pre planning meetings, we could get a little right. definition that we do our meeting. Very good. Very good. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody have anything they'd like to just add at this point in time to the agenda that we sort of oversight? I just want to go back to the field coloring and stuff like that real quick. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take the notes now. Yeah, no, it's, um, yes, yes. So for it's Mr. Grillo. Who's Grillo. 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 So, I mean, I can easily email someone what we're thinking, but. Um, you know, for the where it says rocks in the end zone, Joe mentioned before that we'd like to at least see it with a black base and a white outline in the end zones. 
and tell me when you're ready for the middle ER. So, so the black letters, white outline. That's right. We'd like to just see the black. Yeah, just the reverse right. of what it is. And then in the middle where it says ER, we'd like to also see um, orange ER, black outline, and then a white outline around it. That's what we originally discussed there. So I do remember. So, right. yeah. It'd be, so it'd be nice to, to see that tricolor in the middle. I think it's going to pop the whole field. So you want uh, orange, white, and black, or orange, black, and white? Orange, black, and white. The white will be on the outside. That's correct. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna this one look great. And then the question for John would be is that um, whatever one we go with color can that be painted in during the course of the football season? Uh, so it's not on top of especially the main presentation. Well paint it leave it orange paint green. Would green be easier to match than orange? Yeah. Yeah. Whatever's easy to match. Yep. So you want to paint it green during baseball. Right, or well, vice versa, as Joe's saying, but that's they're the experts. Did you do that? Yeah, they do it in the stadium now. Wow. Just feel the paint. Yeah. Incredible. Maybe a little no, not perfect, but if you feel the ground ball first, have that arm and right. Oh yeah. I'll be every turn on. What's your sport? Football. Okay. Any other? Okay, so I'd like to uh motion that we bring the work session uh, to a closure and it's uh, 759 so and seconded, <laughs> seconded, seconded, and now, now I'd like to make a motion that we go back into executive session at eight o'clock. Can I have a motion? Second. 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 Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody. Cut. Good evening. Lee, should I get you one of those? <laughs>